my friend. I see you followed your nose to this lovely uh, perfumery, perfume yard, perfactory? Yes, let's go with perfactory. Why, I'm Marcos, of course, one of the most successful merchants in all of Greece. You really haven't heard of me? My name is known from Kefalonia to Kos. If you've ever paid money for something, I probably received a percentage. But enough about me. Let's go back to what you're doing here. A word of advice from a former perfume peddler. Never start your sales pitch with, you smell like you could use some perfume. It has a surprisingly low success rate. This sensuous little island is where perfume was produced. Your nostrils are in for a treat, unless you're allergic, in which case I could sell you a wonderful remedy for a very reasonable price. No? Okay then. I'll check in on you at the end of your visit. See you soon, my friend. Perfume making techniques were invented and perfected in Mesopotamia and Egypt, beginning in the 4th millennium BCE. By the time of the Mycenaean era, perfume played an important role in the Greek economy. Mostly reserved for kings, priests and aristocrats in the beginning, it later became more widely available during the classical and Hellenistic periods. Greeks used perfume for more than just personal cosmetics. It also had sacred uses. For example, cults would sometimes anoint their god's statue with perfume, and it was also used during rituals like weddings and funerals. Food and wine could also be scented with perfume to add to a meal's presentation. The art of making perfume was part of medicine and pharmacology, and physicians devoted entire books listing the best perfume recipes. Perfume is made up of two main components. A greasy substance, called an excipient, like vegetable oil or animal fat, and an odorous substance, such as flowers and plants. For ancient Greeks, the most common excipient was olive oil. According to Theophrastus, however, the most valuable oils were those extracted from nuts in the Syrian and Egyptian deserts. The odorous ingredient could be taken from a variety of sources. These include flowers like roses or lilies, herbs like oregano, spices like saffron, resins like amber, and leaves from plants. Some fragrances were also imported from outside of Greece, like Indian cinnamon and Syrian frankincense. These exotic scents were considered exceptionally precious. Mixing scent into the fatty excipient was called enfleurage, of which there were two methods. If the flower being used for the scent was fragile, the preferred method of extraction was cold enfleurage, which required an oil-soaked cloth. First, the cloth was rubbed against the flower's petals, saturating the oil with the scent. Then, the cloth was pressed to wring out the scented oil. Hot enfleurage involved heating the excipient before mixing in the scented substance.
The hot enfleurage process consisted of heating and distillation. After the scented ingredients were dipped into heated oil, the mixture was then filtered before being pressed and decanted. Once the mixture was complete, spices, coloring agents and fixatives were added, along with preservatives to prevent the perfume from spoiling. Finally, the liquid was hermetically sealed in bottles, ready to be shipped to market. Perfume was usually bottled in ceramic or glass flasks, but more luxurious fragrances were contained in ornamented and painted flasks. Lekethoi and Alabastra were elegant bottles designed for women, while Arabaloi were used by athletes. It was common for the bottle's craftsmen to brand them to prevent frauds and knockoffs. Perfume shops were usually located in city centers, befitting of their importance. In addition to selling perfume, they were also sometimes used as meeting places. For example, the perfume shops near Athens's Agora were frequented every morning by the city's youth. The main purpose of perfume was to attract members of both the opposite and the same sex. We can trace this practice back to a scene in the Iliad, where Hera used perfume to seduce Zeus. Similarly, hymns about goddesses like Demeter and Aphrodite always mention their pleasant smell, further solidifying the belief that scent and seduction went hand in hand. However, perfume was also a mark of social status. Athletes covered themselves in perfumed oils during their training and at symposia, and citizens were judged based on how anointed, shiny and perfumed their bodies were. Again, my friend, I hope you see now how important perfume was, not only for aesthetic purposes, but for Greek social hierarchy. I wouldn't charge so much for my own bottles if I didn't know the value of what I was selling. What else can Marcos do for you? Good idea. Let's start with an easy question. Which of the following is an example of an excipient? Flower petals can add a lovely smell to the perfume, but they aren't excipients. Try again. 
plant leaves make great perfume ingredients, but they aren't excipients. Try a different answer. I'm afraid water works better as a drink than as an excipient. Keep trying. Yes, olive oil makes a great excipient. And dressing. And medicine. Honestly, we pour that stuff on everything, including ourselves. And question two. What is anflorage? It does sound like a lovely dance, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it isn't. Try again. Doesn't sound like any sport I've ever heard of. Keep trying. I don't think so, my friend. Try a different answer. Correct. Anflourage involved mixing the perfume scent into an excipient. We're almost done. Just one more question. In the Iliad, which goddess used perfume to seduce Zeus? A fair guess, but in this case, an incorrect one. Try another answer. That's not the version of the Iliad I heard, but wouldn't that be interesting? I don't think so. As funny as it is to imagine the god of the underworld batting his eyelashes at Zeus, try again. Yes, Ira poured a saucy scent on herself to get her husband's attention. You did it! You've completed the test! If you say so, but I have a feeling we'll run into each other again soon. Farewell!